Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? It is currently, let's see what time it is, 2.54 p.m. on Monday afternoon. I am vlogging early today because uh, we have a couples counseling session tonight and I don't know if we're gonna go out to dinner afterwards or if we're gonna get food and watch TV shows afterwards or whatever. So I don't know if I'll have a chance to vlog later. So I was like, I missed vlogging yesterday. I wanna make sure that I'm vlogging today. Um, so I'm vlogging right now so that I can uh, make sure that this vlog gets up. And then I'm gonna render it while I am taking a shower and getting ready for our appointment and then I will upload it while I'm gone. And so when I get home, it should be ready to go. So this vlog probably will be up, I would hope earlier than I usually post. I would think maybe like between like seven and nine sometime, my time, Eastern Standard Time. Um, am I Eastern Standard Time, Central Time? I think I'm Eastern Standard Time. But anyway, it'll be up between like seven and nine. I have to tell you what happened when I came out here. It is so muggy today in Indianapolis. Um, it rained like all last night at times it like poured down rain and so it's just super muggy today and so I brought the camera outside and I got ready to start and I pushed play and I looked in and it was like so foggy like the camera so I had to like clean it off with my shirt and then I was waiting and then it fogged up again and so I was like okay I'm just gonna sit here for a couple minutes and <laughs> wait for the camera to adjust to the outside temperature so I cleaned it off with my shirt again and then I set it back up and yeah so anyway um, I did not vlog yesterday. We went to, I'll talk about this in a second, but we went to this charity event um, that Melissa was having for this dog rescue that she uh, that she is part of. And so when we got home, I was so tired from having stayed up the night before watching TV. And um, then Alex and I were just kind of like laying in bed and stuff. And I fell asleep. He was like watching a show and I was kind of like talking to him while he was watching a show. And I fell asleep and woke up like an hour and a half later. And at that point it was, well, I don't know what time I fell asleep, but it was when I woke up, it was like late, too late for me to like get a vlog done and like render it and publish it where it wouldn't be like published at like 4 a.m., you know? And so I was like, I'm just, Oh, somebody's calling me. Who's calling me? Oh, spam risk. So I was like, I'm just not going to uh, do a vlog. But that wasn't my plan. My plan was actually that when I came home from the charity event that I was going to vlog right away. But I was so tired. So, um, yeah, I just laid in bed with Alex and little Boo Radley and um, took a nap. I had a really nice nap yesterday. So the night before, now listen, listen, Linda. <laughs> I have had so many comments about me talking about TV shows that I have made an executive administrative decision. <laughs> as much as I would like to talk about TV shows and as much as I did my all of this and everything like that, there are so many mixed comments about me talking about TV shows that I'm just going to tell you guys what TV shows I'm watching, but I won't tell you anything about it. <laughs> okay? And um, I know that some of you are like, oh no, I like when you talk about TV shows. Others of you are like, I'm so bored of you talking about TV shows. Some of you are like, I like when you give the spoilers because that lets me know like if I want to watch a show or not. Others of you are like, you said you weren't going to spoil a TV show and you've spoiled the whole thing. And so I'm just not going to talk about the TV shows anymore that I'm watching. I'll just tell you what I'm watching. So the other night, um, was this last night or was it the night before? This was the night before. Um, I finished the final two episodes of season one of La Brea. So I finished episode nine and ten. There's ten episodes. And um, then it, it comes back out, I think, either September 22nd or September 27th. So if you want to watch the second season of La Brea, it's, the first season is on Hulu and Peacock. <clears throat> the second season is coming out soon. I, this is not spoiling it. I'll just tell you. It reminds me of Lost. That's all I'll say. Um, so if you liked Lost, it's, you'll probably like La Brea. So it's kind of like going to the bookstore or the library when they say, if you liked this book, if you liked Gone Girl, then you'll like, you know, I'll be gone in the dark. That kind of thing. So anyway, then I was like trying to figure out what I wanted to watch next. I'm trying to kind of go from watching, well, La Brea wasn't dark. I wouldn't say that it was dark at all. Like, you know, these true crime documentaries that I watch or, um, 
uh, like these dark thrillers, which I love. I love those shows. But sometimes when I watch a lot of them in a row, um, it just got really sunny, so I don't know how that's showing up. Here, let me move my camera a little bit. Um, I, sometimes when I watch a lot of these like thrillers in a row, it just is a lot. And so um, I think that's why, like when I watched that Boo Bitch show on Netflix, like I really enjoyed it because it was just kind of silly and it just wasn't, there was no real deep thought to it. And so it was kind of a nice, um, I don't know, vacation for a while from all of the, like, dark thrillers that I had been watching. So I was kind of, wa I wanted to watch something that was a little bit more lighthearted. So I started watching Love, Victor. Um, I had seen the first season of Love, Victor, but the second and the third season had come out. It's on Hulu. Um, and it, the third season is the final season. So all the seasons are out if you want to watch it. Um, Love, Victor is a spinoff of the book and movie. Well, the book was called um, Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda by Becky Albertalli. And the, they made it into the movie called Love, Simon. And it's, a big, it's about a kid coming out. So it's a young adult story about a kid coming out. Love, Victor. Love, Victor. Love, Victor is a spinoff of that. And it's about this kid coming out and he writes to Simon. Um, and so all three seasons are kind of about that. Um, and again, that's not spoiling it. I just want to make this clear, okay? You can read the description of the show and it'll tell you that. Um... So, I started watching the second season. I forgot how, how really well done it is. And, um, I... That night I watched five episodes. Last night I watched just one episode. Um, and so, of the second season, it's ten episodes of the second season, eight episodes of the third season. So, I have seven, eight, nine, ten. I have four episodes of the second season to watch and then eight episodes of the third season to watch and then I'm done with that. So I'll probably finish that in like two days or something. Um, it's really good. You know, I watch these shows like Love, Victor or like the movie Love, Simon. And I think especially like Love, Simon and Love, Victor because they kind of take place in like neighborhoods and schools that were very similar to the school and the neighborhood that, like, I grew up in going to, you know? Like, Creekwood High, um, where si if you've not seen the movie Love, Simon, which is where he goes, and Becky Albertalli, who is the writer, she wrote Love, Simon, and then she wrote, uh, Leah on the Offbeat, which is about Simon's best friend, and she, the whole world that she writes in, they call the Simon verse. And so she writes a lot about people that are, like, friends with Simon or know Simon or they're, like, so it's... But anyway, that whole kind of, like, group of friends is very similar to the friends that I had, kind of, when I was in high school. You know, and I, when I watch these shows or movies, um, what's the other one that I read the graphic novels by, uh, oh, I can't think of her name now, The Heartstopper. Um, it's on Netflix. <clears throat> The graphic novels are fantastic, and you can get all of them on um, Amazon. There's four graphic novels out, Heartstopper. The Heartstopper uh, series on Netflix takes you for, through just the first, uh, the, the first book. It adds and takes away some stuff, but it's so fantastically done, you know. And, and again, even though that takes place in the UK, it's another kind of a book and television sh series that's very similar to a lot of like me growing up and you know one of the things is like and i've talked about this on here before if i had had those resources when i was growing up as a kid um like there was there was a line this is not going to spoil it this is just a line okay but there was a line in the show when I was watching it last night where one of the characters says, people think it's so easy to come out in today's time, but that's not true. Like, there's still a lot of difficult things that we have to go through, meaning, like, parents and kids that aren't accepting and religiosity and things like that. And I think that's so true, right? But I do think that it is a lot more acceptable than it was in 1990 and definitely a lot more than, in than it was in 1970 or 1950, right? Um, but I can remember, like, 
when I was like in high school, like 10th, 11th, 12th grade. And, um, you know, the movies <clears throat> that had any kind of gay identification were like, it was like that movie with, uh, I can't, uh, Kate Jackson, I think is her name, that played Sabrina on Charlie's Angels, and her husband was gay, and it was called Making Love, and even, like, the title of that, right? Like, you know, and he had, like, an affair with this man, and it was all, like, just like that. And then I can remember coming out, <clears throat> and the movies were all, like, any movie that you saw that had any kind of relatable quality to it. Like, I can remember watching Longtime Companion. I loved that. I loved that movie, and I still love that movie. But that movie was chronicled the beginning of AIDS through and through the 80s, you know, and this group of friends that was affected by it. And it was like, when I came out, any book or movie that had any kind of gay identification in it was... Um, it was all about AIDS. And when I was in high school, the books were either like, like I can remember there was this movie that like this guy introduced me to when I like came out, this guy that I was dating. I've talked about him on here before, Jack. He's since passed away. But we watched this movie called Querell, Q-U-E-R-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And it was very like homoerotic. I didn't even understand it. It was very artsy. And, I mean, it was just, like, stuff like that. Or, like, if you were to find any kind of, like, gay literature, I can remember standing in bookstores and, like, gay literature, like, it would be, like, gay and lesbian literature existed between, like, self-help and erotica. And it would be, like, one bookshelf, if even that. And thrown in there with, like, maybe one or two fictional LGBT books... Well, there were no book, no trans books at all at that time, you know, and no bisexual books. So, I mean, if you, there were maybe, like, one gay book of fiction and one lesbian book of fiction. And it would be right next to, like, the gay Kama Sutra. And so the feeling that you had inside was this very dirty feeling, you know, that it, it sexualized everything. And I think about that, like, you know... Like, I've, I've really thought about that through the years. Like, I can remember when I wrote this. Um, I don't talk about this often on here. But I had, like, this um, this article that I wrote for the Huffington Post. And um, it kind of, like, went crazy viral a little bit. Because in Indiana, at the time, Governor Pence, who then became Vice President Pence... He passed the Religious Freedom Act, which basically meant that anybody could ref refuse you service based on their religious rights. And so I had been reached out to by somebody that I had known that um, was going to be talking to the Senate Voting Committee or something on that. And so she asked me to write this letter um, about how, my, how Alex and I were affected by the Religious Freedom Act. And so, you know, I went in there and I wrote this whole thing about, um, like, gym memberships. Like, we couldn't have a gym membership together because, you know, at that time there was no marriage equality. And so we couldn't have, I mean, and I know that sound, sounds silly and stupid to a lot of people, but it's, it's things like that, you know, it's getting asked at a, at a table at a restaurant, you know, separate or checks together kind of thing. And it's going to a grocery store. And, you know, it's just, it's all of those things, this division <clears throat> that I have lived with pretty much my entire life since I realized that I was gay. And even then, it's like one, book sh one bookshelf in a bookstore, you know? And so when I go to bookstores today... And during Pride Month, they have an entire section, you know, in a young adult section dedicated to LGBTQIA plus authors and own voices and characters. And th it's just, it's so fantastic, you know, because had I had that, had I had that, those resources when I was coming out or when I was realizing that I was w gay or whatever, I think I realized it a lot earlier than I, you know, than I knew, but I think I pushed it down so far because I 
was so scared of it. I think had I had those resources, I don't know that I think that it would have necessarily made it, I don't think it would have made it any easier for me to come out. I mean, I just had to say those words. I just had to do the work, you know, on myself. It was really work on myself. And it was really about getting to a point where I had to, I wanna make sure that I say this the right way. It was really about getting to the point where my happiness was more important than other people's acceptance of me. I don't know if that makes sense. But where if I looked at somebody and I said I'm gay, I mean, I, to even just say that out loud today is so bizarre because I, you know, like, I mean, I don't say that on a regular basis, like I'm gay, right? But I can remember saying to people, you know, in my, when I, after I came out and for several years after that, like, well, you know, I'm gay or I'm gay or whatever, you know, and it was like this qualifier. And um, I look back on that, like I should never have had to have said that, you know, and, um, But it's a scary thing, and because you don't know how people are going to respond to it. You have no clue, right? Like, even your most accepting friends and family could be the people, um, if the people that love you the most might be the people that are the ones that are the least accepting of it. I will say, a, a, this show, like, dis like, it discusses, like, all of these issues of, like, friends and family, and it's so fantastic you know, that we have shows like, that. I mean, every show that I watch, I feel like discusses those issues, you know, and that you never know who is going to be accepting. You never know who's going to be loving. But I do think this, like, had I had a book, let's say, that discussed like parents and coming out to parents or like even showed that, like even showed that in a TV show or a movie or a book and like somebody sitting down and actually saying to their parents, like, I'm gay, like there's something I, to like role model that or to even kind of like, um, not really role model it, but to script it so that I knew what that could look like. Like, I had no idea. I had no idea, right? Like, how to sit down and say that to my parents. And I had nobody to ask. I wasn't comfortable enough to my friends to talk to them and say, like, I'm gay and I need to come out to my parents and you and everybody. I mean, I didn't feel comfortable with any of that, right? And I think one of the hardest things was, I've talked a lot about this on here before, was that I was so bullied for it that you know, when you're bullied for something, then that becomes the last thing that you want to be, right? So, in my head, when I knew this is who you are, you're gay, and I have kids at school that are making fun of me for being gay, I don't want them to be right. I don't want them, I don't want to look at them and go, yep, you're right, I am gay, right? which probably in retrospect would have been so much easier than just saying, well, I never really said no. I just kind of just didn't address it at all, you know? Um, and it was interesting. I remember when I was working. Um, so, you know, I worked... Now, I don't think I ever have talked about this, actually. You know, I worked 13 years for, in this treatment facility. And um, I was never told that I couldn't talk about my partners, my boyfriends at that time. I worked 13 years, and the entire 13 years I had, you know, a partner. Because um, during the beginning of it was when I was with my first boyfriend. And the second part of it was when I was with my second boyfriend. And um, we broke up December before I resigned in January. And I can remember saying something to my supervisor one time, and she was rather religious. And, you know, and she was one person that would ask a lot of questions, and she asked a lot of, like, pitcher-catcher questions. Do you guys know what I mean by that? Like, pitcher, like, who's the pitcher, who's the catcher kind of deal? You know, and she would ask it in these vague kind of ways, which I've always, you know... A, I think if somebody's going to ask those kind of questions, then it is, it's not my job to educate people, but I do think it's my job to educate people on, 
um, the appropriateness of those questions. Like, you wouldn't sit down and ask your parents or heterosexual friends those kind of questions of what, you wouldn't sit down with your girlfriend, I mean, maybe you would if you're 22, I think, but I mean, I don't have these kind of adult conversations with Tanya or with my other friends, you know, like, now, do you give, you know, when you're giving your husband head at night, like, I mean, we don't have those conversations and we never have in 25 years and we've never found the necessity to. And call me a prude all you want, but we don't have those kind of conversations. And even my husband, who is, makes a lot of sexual innuendo jokes. I know he doesn't even have those kind of conversations with his girlfriends. So to ask a gay man and to think it's okay to ask a gay man, are you a pitcher or are you a catcher? Like it's so inappropriate. But I think the problem is, is that we don't have open conversations about how to ask people those questions. And really what they're asking is gender roles within a relationship. They're really wanting to know, well, or they'll say like, well, who's the man or who's the woman? Implying that there's, and then that goes back to like 1950, that we have these gender roles of like what we assume is that like a woman's in a kitchen and a man does it works all day long and provide you know it's like we're going back to all of that 1950 1930 kind of bs right and that's really what people are asking is well what are the roles that you all play when the reality is in our relationship and in most relationships gay relationships that i know is there are no gender roles like that period there just aren't you know and um so, but I will say that, like, she never asked, and it wasn't just her, it was other people that I worked with, she never asked in, like, a rude way. Like, I could just tell she really was truly interested, she just didn't know how to ask those questions, and so my job was to say, you know, that's not appropriate to ask questions. If you really are interested, if you really want to know, like, if I take it or give it, like, I don't have a problem telling you that. Like, I've never had a problem, like, let's have an open conversation about sex, you know? I'm so thankful that my parents were very open in talking about all kinds of anything, you know, religiosity, sexuality, whatever. The, the only problem was when they were talking to me about sex, they were talking to me about sex I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't going to need to know anything about, you know what I mean? But um, I don't have a problem having those conversations with people. I've never had a problem having those conversations with people. I just don't know what it is you're really wanting to know. Like, what's the question you're really asking in that question? And I can remember she and I were driving home and I said to her, like, what is it, we were driving home from somewhere and I said, what is it you're really wanting to know in that question, you know? And she's like, well, I just don't know, like, how do you figure out, like, what it is? And I said, well, like anything else, you know? I mean, you figure out what you like and what you don't like. And, you know, she was like, what is it the same with every person? And I said, no, it's not necessarily. I said, for some people it is, for some people it isn't. I said, you know, it's like, it's fluid, you know? And I think we're talking more about sexual likes and dislikes being fluid today in 2022 and we're talking about gender being fluid and we're talking about sexuality being fluid but we couldn't have those conversations in 1995 you know when I started working there we, we could have had those conversations we didn't I don't think we knew how to have those conversations so I do not a feel like it's my job to educate people but b I have always attempted to when like, I, I want to make this clear. It's not my job t to tell somebody right and wrong. It's not my job to educate somebody. But B, I have taken that opportunity when I could. If I felt like the, the people that were asking or I was having a conversation with were going to learn from it. Because why would I not want to educate somebody on something, you know? I only learn things by asking questions or by people saying to me, okay, we don't use these words or we don't say these things or whatever, you know, and then I go, okay, uh, thank you for educating me on these and in the future I will do better, right? Because I am a believer that when we know better, we do better and we have to educate people on those things, right? If we... <laughs> If we just come from a place of anger and go, well, why the hell are you asking me if I'm a pitcher or a catcher? You know, I mean, I think in 2022, maybe we don't ask those questions <laughs> as much because we know better. But I don't know. Maybe some people don't. I think a lot of people still don't know that those aren't the questions that we that we ask and things like that. I don't. Who knows? I don't know. You know, why am I rambling about this? But what I was going to say was that, um, and, and, you know, I think the other thing is, like, the assumption that, like, because I'm effeminate or my voice is effeminate, that people automatically know that I'm gay. 
you know, there's I, I've met men that have effeminate voices and act effeminately that are not gay. And I have know a lot of gay men and I've met a lot of gay men that are very, you know, straight acting or masculine and not because they're trying to, but that's just who they are that you wouldn't know, um, you know? So I think that's a hard thing, but when I was working in this facility, which let me clarify, was not a religious facility, okay? It was not. Um, but my supervisor, like, there were times that I wanted to come out, especially towards the end, I would say like the last three or four years, and she would say, you do what you want to do. She would say, like, I will back you 100%. But I just think there's a lot of, like, family members and people that wouldn't really understand. But you do what you want to do. Like, she really kind of pushed it down and was like... <sighs> this was also a woman that said she would never let her daughters listen to Britney Spears because she thought that she was a bad role model. <laughs> I was like, okay. I mean, I love this woman. She taught me, you know, so much about just the world and everything. But, um, so, I never did, you know. I never, in six and a half years of having a long-term relationship with this person that I thought I would spend the rest of my life with, I never had a picture on my desk. You know, I never talked about him at work. I mean, with my coworkers, I did. All the time with my coworkers, you know? I mean, they knew what his name was. They knew what he did. Half of them, you know, like, went to him to get his hair done, you know? But, like, they didn't, like, outside of that, like, I didn't, like, the way that I do in videos talking about Alex, like, I didn't talk about him at all. It was like he didn't exist. And I remember I was talking to this patient one time, and she said to me, I'll never forget this. She just kind of, we were talking about just something totally random and she looked at me and she said, um, what's your boyfriend's name? And I was like, what? And she said, because, um, like people n don't really ever come out and ask, you know, like, are you gay or whatever? They just like throw insults at you, you know? And she said, what's your boyfriend's name? And I said, what? And she said, well, you're handsome. She said, you're smart. She said, you're funny. I just assume you have a boyfriend. And I said, you know, his name is whatever. And I said, and the reason I'm asking you is, or I'm answering you is because you've asked so respectfully, you know? And, um, it was the first time that I felt kind of seen and validated, you know, that it, it wasn't about, are you gay or whatever? It was like, somebody saw me in a different kind of way. There's so much that goes along <clears throat> with coming out. And I think that people think, you know, like you just come out of the closet and then you're, you're out and you're done and everything's great. And I think my neighbors must have been out of town for the weekend because they both just came home in their separate cars, but they drove home. They drove into their driveway, like, <laughs> like one drove in and then the other one drove in right behind. Um, but I think there's like this, you know, and, and it, first of all, everybody's coming out experience is totally different. Number one, I want to say. Number two, family and friends have their own coming out experience. And this is something I've said in videos before, and I think this is really important. I think this is important for family and friends to know, and I think this is important for members of the LGBTQIA plus community to know. That just because we're ready to come out and say to our friends, our family, and our loved ones, I'm gay or you know, whatever... Um, however we identify, does not mean that they're ready to hear that. And they have a process of coming out as well. My mother's process looked very different than my dad's process. My dad, he looked at me and he said, Peter, I've known that you were gay since you were four years old. And <clears throat> my dad is very much of the belief that we are born, however, and he believes that it's completely genetic and scientific. And <clears throat> my mom struggled with her religious beliefs and really struggled with it at first, you know, she never didn't love me. That was never it. It was just that she struggled with, I would say to her more religious friends saying my son is gay. You know, she would say like my special friend and things like that. <clears throat> the other thing is when I came out to my mom, well, I actually told my mom that I was bisexual first. We used to, back in the day, we would say bi now, gay later, because it just seemed like it was easier to come out as bisexual, which is such ridiculousness now when, I mean, with my bisexual friends, I feel like they struggle so much more and they really have, 
I feel like people really struggle to believe or um, validate their belief systems. You know, it's always like they want to... <clears throat> I think really the way that 30 years ago... The camera stopped. I really think that 30 years ago, the way that people sexualized gay men, and really I think in the last 30 years, the way that people have sexualized lesbians... You know, we're like, straight guys are like, yeah, my girlfriend's a part-time lesbian. It's like, that is so sick and disgusting. You know what I mean? Like, come on now. I think that is what bisexual people deal with on a daily basis. I really do, you know? That people want to sexualize it. Oh, so you just want the best of both worlds. or Like, they don't really understand it, you know? They don't really understand well that if I'm bisexual and I fall in love with a man, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to go and have sex with 15 women a week either. Like, it doesn't work that way, you know? And, like, they don't really ever take the time to read up on it or understand it or whatever. Like, I I can remember, um, <laughs> there's a line, <laughs> I can't, see, I can't say it, because if I say it, people say I'm spoiling things, even though it's not spoiling it. But, um, when... A lot of these new terms came out, like pansexual. You know, I, I honestly, I didn't understand it, you know, as, I mean, I think people assume that, like, oh, you're part of the LGBTQIA plus community. You should just assume what the, you should just understand what these terms mean. I didn't know what pansexual meant. I had no idea what it meant. And honestly, it was when I was watching couples couples therapy or something it was a tv show with dr jen where couples went into the house do you guys know what i'm talking about they lived in that house and carmen carrera who had been on rupaul's drag race and then came out later as trans she and her husband were on the show and i think he identified as pansexual on the show and they talked about it and i was like i don't really I don't really think I understand this term. I thought I understood this term, but maybe I don't understand this term. And so I started, you know, um, reading, excuse me, reading articles about it. I had a couple people that I knew that identified as pansexual. And so I went to them and I said, can you explain this to me, like in layman's terms? Because I don't understand it and I want to understand it. Let me see what time it is. I want to make sure that I don't go over. Um, I want to make sure that I, I understand it. I, you know, don't want to be disrespectful to people on and on and on. And they were like, yeah, absolutely. And, um, but I think it's just about educating ourselves. The thing is, I think that, and we all don't just come out when we're, you know, 20 either. A lot of people come out in their forties or fifties. A lot of people come out, you know, after they've had kids and have marriages. And I think a lot of people like that are, really kind of like looked down upon because it's like well you like you did this to your wife or you did this to your husband and you knew all along and how could you possibly do that and it's one of the scariest things ever it really really is you know because you don't it's like you're gonna jump into this you know jump off this cliff and you don't know if you're gonna land or where you're gonna land or how you're gonna land you don't know what it's gonna look like on the other side you know i mean looking at I mean, I, first of all, everybody was making fun of me for being gay, okay? All of my friends were so just different and artsy, and if, if they were, if anybody was going to be accepting of somebody gay, it was going to be my friend group, right? And then C, my friend, my, my parents were so liberal-minded that, and had a lot of gay friends, that if anybody was going to have parents that were accepting of their child being gay, it was going to be my parents, right? But even then, I was terrified. And I think that what happens is, like, you know, I came out, and then I started, like, my drinking just went through the roof, and then my drug use went through the roof, and I think it just was, like, I was just constantly in this constant state of just muting my feelings and who I was and all this kind of stuff, which is why when I went into treatment, my counselor was like, you know, don't you think that your being gay has something to do with your use? And I was like, no, not at all. I'm completely fine with it, you know? asked me 30 years later and I think, oh, I think it had a lot to do with it. I think it had a lot to do with my drinking and my drugging, you know? And, um, and I think that's sad, you know, that I wasn't able to realize it for all those years. And I think that coming out is a, uh, a continuous process. I don't think it's anything that you just one day are completely out. 
you know, it's not like you tell people and you tell everybody in your life, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay. And then after you've told everybody you're out, like then it's this acceptance, then it's this understanding, then it's this level of being comfortable. Then it's like going to a restaurant, going to a grocery store, holding somebody's hand in public, saying I love you in public, you know, standing up for your rights, standing up for what you believe in. I mean, it's just this continuous process that you kind of go through like your entire life, you know, there's no matter how much support and love you have from people around you. And, um, I would love to tell you, like, I don't, like I say this in, in videos when I talk about the bullying, like I would love to tell you that the bullying still doesn't affect me today or doesn't affect me today. And that, I, cause I don't want to be a victim of it for the rest of my life. I don't want to be on my deathbed being like, well, I was bullied in high school. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, who wants to talk about that? It's, I don't. Right. But to act like that didn't have an effect on my foundation years of growing into the person that I am today, I can't say that to be true. Um, it absolutely had an effect on who I was. You know, I think that's just like, I think it was abuse that I suffered from other people. And I think that just like anybody else that has gone through trauma when they're growing up, because when I get comments and people say things like, we get it, you were bullied, okay, like, move on to something else. It's like, it's my story, I'm going to talk about it if I want to talk about it. If you don't like it, you don't have to watch this video, right? So, when I get those comments, I'm always like, would you tell another trauma survivor that? Like, would you tell them, like, move on from your trauma? Like, it, you don't know. I, I re respond to the bullying today in a completely different way than I did 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I didn't even know how to talk about it. 30 years ago, I didn't even acknowledge it because I didn't want to give any power to those people who basically had taken my story from me. I couldn't even come out on my own because they had already stolen that from me, right? So, today, it's in a completely different way and one of the reasons why I talk so much about it today on my videos or whatever is because I don't know that there's not a mother out there or a grandmother or a child or somebody watching this you know or a, a neighbor or a teacher that's watching this it's like okay I really re this resonates with me like this is what I needed to hear you know and um, so yeah and I probably will continue to talk about it. I think it needs to be talked about, you know? I didn't even talk about the charity event yesterday. <laughs> so yesterday we got up and um, we, uh, Alex and Sarah and I, we went to this charity event that Melissa had. There was like 200 people there, maybe more. Um, and it was at this like bar restaurant. It was really cute. It was really well done. And it was this bingo that we missed last year because we were out of town. For, it usually falls when we're out of town for our anniversary. But I think we went two years ago and it's like you play bingo and you win gift cards and stuff. Alex won $100 in gift cards. <laughs> Amazon and I can't remember what the other one was. Sarah won a gift card. I won nothing. <laughs> um, but it was fun. And then they had it like catered. Um... They had, like, uh, Mexican food, and so it was really good. And then they had ice cream at the end, and it was really fun. It was from 12 to 4. But um, I'd stayed up late the night before watching shows, TV shows, Love, Victor. So when I came home yesterday, I was so tired that I, like, fell asleep, you know. But anyway, we had a really good time. It was Alex and I, and we sat at a table with Sarah, and then... Aaron and Eric were there, and then two of our other friends that went with us to Vegas for, um, they're kind of like part of the group too, that went with us for Jason's birthday, and then Jason sat right next to me. And then Melissa was like running all around because she's a volunteer for this place. They raised like $25,000 or something like that. It was amazing. They had a live auction. They had all kinds of stuff. They were auctioning like trips and stuff like that. It was really cool. It was really well done, and it was really fun, and she does it every year. Yeah, so uh, that was yesterday. And then Alex watched, oh, that dragon show, that spinoff. Hey, how are you? Hi. Were you guys out of town? Yeah, we were in Bloomington. Oh, okay. At a how fun. He was walking the dog. He said they were at a b and in Bloomington. Um, so, Alex was watching that dragon show that's a spinoff of Game of Thrones. And then he started watching some other show, and I don't know what he was watching. But he went to bed really early last night. 
So. And now I need to start getting ready because I need to take a shower and I'm sweating bullets out here and I need to take a shower and I need to get this vlog uploaded and get ready so that I can get to get the Uber called in time. So anyway, thank you guys for hanging out with me out here on the patio on the front porch. It's been so fun. And um, that was a different kind of vlog today, wasn't it? Anyway, um, bop, 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 bop. something else? Anything? Anything else? <laughs> I don't think so. I hope you guys are having a magically amazing, it's today Monday, Monday. And if nobody else has told you this today, I love you. And remember these three very important things. One, you can start your day over whenever you want. Two, practice random acts of kindness, but don't tell anyone. And three, most importantly, practice random acts. I just said that, didn't I? But three, most importantly, reach out to somebody and let them know how much they mean to you. Please don't forget this. Reach out to somebody. Just tell them, hi, I was thinking of you, or whatever. Oh, and the four, fourth most important thing, I think tomorrow, because somebody messaged me, I think tomorrow is the pumpkin spice latte launch day at Starbucks. That's the fourth most important thing of the day. Anyway, um, I will see you guys here tomorrow, same place, same time, or around this time. And thank you for hanging out with me. Uh, be kind to one another. Love one another a little bit more. And most importantly, love yourself the most. And I love you guys, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye. Love you. Oh, and for those that need to hear it, and those that want to hear it, and those that just happen to stick around, one more I love you. I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Love you. Happy birthday, Lena.